BBC4 Collections, specially chosen programmes from the BBC Archive. For this collection, Max Hastings has selected interviews with Great War veterans filmed in the 1960s. More programmes on this theme and other BBC4 Collections are available on BBC iPlayer. Well, I was one of about 2,000 blokes stuck in the Galica. Uh, we left Mudros after nightfall on the 24th, and uh, we were all camped down in the bowels of the ship. Uh, the crew brought us some hot tucker to get on with, but I don't think any of us felt like eating. And then somebody said, well, you better have a snore off. You've got a job to do in the morning. Uh, but we couldn't sleep, but we just talked about anything but the job we were going to do. And uh, we pulled in, I should think, about a quarter to six. Uh, the Majestic was just behind us. The 3rd Brigade had got on, and uh, it was pretty obvious that old Joe Burke knew that they were there because there was plenty of firing, and uh, evidently he got some field guns, and they were dropping quite a bit of shrapnel. Um, we lined up on the Galica and uh, waited for the pinnaces and the toes to come back. And as we were lined up, the old bosun of the Galica came along and said, anybody got any letters to post? Anybody got any of those dirty postcards that you bought in Cairo? If you have, you better put them down on the deck because if you get not, they send them to your next of kin. Well, by this time, I was feeling just about as brave as a ringtail possum. And uh, I wish that I was anywhere but on the Galica. Anyhow, the boats eventually pulled alongside. We were all done up like sore toes with rifles and shovels and ammunition and packs. And how we got down those rope ladders, I just don't know. Uh, what with the nervousness and the excitement of not knowing what was in front of us, uh, I just felt washed out. But as I got into the boat, the first thing that struck me were about three chaps of the 9th Battalion who had been killed and they hadn't had time to lift them out. So we had to walk gingerly over these fellows. And then I heard the voice of the little middy that was pulling these three boats. It, it was a child's voice, really. And I thought, well, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. And we packed in the cobbers of us together and the shrapnel was falling, the machine guns were pelting, and uh, as the pinnace hit the shore, we boats at the back were pulled up into anything three, four foot of water. Somebody said, out you get, and out we got. Uh, lumbering this shovel and rifle and pack and ammunition. As I say, we were loaded like blessed elephants. There were dead and wounded of the third brigade all round, and uh, we scampered as hard as we could to a, a little bit of shelter, dumped their packs and dumped the shovels and the picks. We'd had enough of those. And then somebody said, well, up you go, and away we went up the slope. Uh, it wasn't too bad, but just halfway up, somebody shouted out to me, Alan Corden has stopped one. Well, Alan was one of my best pals, and that made me feel a bit better, because if they'd got him, I felt I'm going to get them. Anyhow, we got to the top, and the... The third brigade had done a good job. He'd pushed them back quite a bit. And we were extending out to the front, uh, to the right, uh, along the Garba Tipi front. And uh, it was scrub country, uh, quite flat, but plenty of tea tree bush about. And uh, we'd go about 20 or 30 yards, and then we'd be held up by rifle fire, machine gun fire. But uh, we got down and pitched into them. Uh, Eventually they ran and we went on and on. But eventually we came to a post where the, obviously one of the strong points that he'd put up. And uh, I suppose there were about 20 of us in my group. Uh, nobody in charge. The bloke with the loudest voice seemed to take charge of the setting. 
and uh, three or four blokes got knocked. And then I heard somebody say, well, oh, this is no good to us. Come on, heads down, arses up and get stuck into it. And uh, we went into it. And we cleared them, bayoneted them, shot them, and the others ran. And uh, we sort of dug in on that post for a little while. And uh, a little while afterwards, a bloke out of the 8th Battalion said, here, look at that bloody bush, it's moving. And uh, we looked at it, and it was obviously a sniper. Uh, he was a sniper, and he was done up like a Christmas tree. He'd got branches out of his head, out of his shoulders, and, and he was for all the world like a, a bush. But he didn't look like a bush when we'd finished it. Well, we went on and on, and I say we kept getting held up and uh, firing back when they were firing. And then somebody said, we've got the impression that we'd have got right through if we'd have had plenty of support coming with us. But then somebody said, we've got to go back. And by this time, old Joe Burke had got plenty of reinforcements and he was making it a bit sticky. Uh, we got back to the first ridge and we started to dig in. Uh, there was no coordinated effort about it. We were just a crowd of diggers working with each other, trusting each other blind. And uh, after we'd been digging a little while, um, the Queen Elizabeth let go two or three of her shells. And the sound of those shells was, 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 a, was a real tonic. And one bloke shouted out, share that amongst you, you bastards. And uh, the bloke next to me was Robbie Robinson, a corporal in my battalion. Uh, he was laughing at the uh, remark that this digger had made about sharing this Queen Elizabeth shells. And uh, I can see him now grinning all over his face, and the next thing I remember was his head fell on my shoulder, and the sniper had got him through the juggler vein, and I really think that that was my baptism, because Robbie's blood spent all over my tunic. Well, it was fairly obvious uh, that the position we held on that first night was just about as slender as it could be, and I'm quite sure that not any one of us ever saw a possibility of getting off alive. Uh, for my point, I think I'd have run as hard as I could. But the fact that my cobbers were there and they were ready to help me uh, kept me there because, you know, in the diggers, we just trusted each other blind. And uh, while one bloke stood there, he, he could bet his sweet life that the other mate was going to be with him. And if we went, we'd all go together. Well, uh, having dug in, there was only one thing to do, was to stop where we'd dug in. If he'd, if he'd come at us and been successful, he could have got us back into the sea. And uh, all during the night, there was plenty of shrapnel and machine guns and snipers as busy as they could be. But we lived through, and... Uh, it was about nine o'clock the next day that we could see that he was bringing up plenty of stuff to have a go, and I think he'd made up his mind to dump us. And uh, well, somewhere about half past nine, I should think, in the morning, uh, we could hear him shouting Allah and blowing trumpets and things like that. And uh, there was quite a lot of heavy firing, uh, and plenty from us, and he, as far as I know, he had the days, and... Then the uh, Royal Naval Division came on to relieve us from the front line, as it were. Oh, there, and there, there was another thing on the night of the 25th. They brought up some Indian mountain batteries, I think they called them. Well, they, they could only dig in about 20 yards behind where we were because if they dug any farther down, they'd have been shooting into the hillside. And uh, having got their guns in, they joined in the general shelling and bombardment and they were firing what they call grape shot. Well, this was shrapnel that evidently burst the moment it left the gun muzzle. And blimey, we had to scatter each time those batteries went. Uh, well, uh, uh, and then on the 28th, as I say, the Royal Naval Division came, and we were evacuated from the line into these little humpies just in the sand hills. And it was then for the first time since the landing that we'd been able to look around for our cobbers, because uh, on the first day we were just mixed up and running about like a lot of rabbits. Nobody could uh, see who was who or what was what. 
And uh, it was then, for the first time, we realised what the taking of Anzac Ridge had cost, because hardly any of our mates were left there. Well, we cooled off there for a day or two, and uh, one or two of us got into the sea and washed ourselves in the mud and that sort of thing. And then we were told we were going over to Cape Ellers, that was my brigade, the 5th, 6th, 7th and 8th Battalion, uh, to give the 29th Division a hand in an attack over there. And I remember they put us into all sorts of little boats and monitors, and the old Bacanti was our escort along. When we got over the Hellas, we saw what a hell of a job the 29th Division had had, barbed wire in the water, and, and my battalion actually landed on Hellas through the River Clyde, which had been beached. And uh, the story of the Munster and Dublin Fusiliers at a fourth outboat, everybody knows. Anyhow, we, they got us into a sort of a dried up water course and we were told that we were going to take part in a general attack uh, on the afternoon of the 8th. And uh, just before the advance, uh, the guns of the battleships, the artillery that we'd been able to get ashore and round about, put up a barrage and I've honestly listened to several, but I can't ever remember a more concentrated or Heavy barrage, well, it was indescribable. The noise, the dust, the, you just couldn't hear each other speak. And that went on for about a quarter of an hour, and then everything was as silent as the blessed grave. And that was the time when we had to hop out. And uh, the barrage had been so heavy that we thought, well, this is going to be a cakewalk, and there's nothing to stop us. But the mistake we made was that after we got out of our hop-out trenches, our own artillery began to put down a barrage just in front of us. Some of it was firing short. You could see your mates going down right and left. And uh, you were face to face with a stark realisation that this is the end of it. And uh, uh, that was the thought uh, that was with you the whole time because despite the fact that we couldn't see a Turk, he was pelting us with everything he'd got from all corners. And the marvel to me is how the Dickens he was able to do it after the barrage that had fallen on him. And uh, sure enough, we got to within about a mile of Prithia village when I copped my packet. And as I lay down, I said, thank Christ for that. Well, without doubt, Posse Ayres was the heaviest, bloodiest, rottenest stunt that ever the Australians were caught up in. Uh, it's, the carnage is just indescribable. And uh, I can remember as we were making our attack after the 3rd Brigade had gone through that we were literally walking over the dead bodies of our cobbers that had been slain by this barrage. I can't imagine anything more concentrated than the artillery barrage of the Germans uh, at that particular stunt. Uh, he was even shelling our front line with great coal boxes. And uh, I remember twice, and I'm sorry about the remember, you'll have to cut it out, the bay on our left went in, two or three chaps were killed, the bay on our right went in. Uh, I said to the chap whose knees I was sitting on, it's our turn next. I hadn't said it before we were buried. I was quite unconscious, but eventually a pick hit me on the shoulder. Uh, I was picked up and sent down to the battalion for that first aid post. Uh, I think I was given a drop of salvolatily or something. I wish it had been rum. And uh, I was sat in a corner of this aid post for a little while, but then the wounded just streamed in and the chap in charge of the post said, oh, well, you've had enough, you better get back again. And I went back and during the whole of that period, I can't remember anything more nerve-wracking than the continuous shelling uh, without stop, day and night. And the, the number of casualties that we suffered there must have been greater than any other engagement in the war. We lived wild, like wild animals, uh, and each time we got into the forward area, 
every action of ours was a wild animal action. Uh, with the difficulties of getting supplies up, we scrounged, we robbed dead bodies to get food, and uh, it was inevitable that we developed the animal characteristic of killing. And apart from the short feeling of nervousness, as you knew that you were moving up to carry out another operation, there was a feeling of exultation that once again, you were going to be able to, with rifle, bayonet, and a couple of Mills bombs in your pocket, to overcome any opposition that you ran into, and at the same time, extract retribution from the fellows that had killed your mates, so many of them that uh, each time you were able to push another one out of it, you felt that you'd done something to compensate for the loss of these fellows that had become part of your very life.